the peaks of the Tatra Mountains. This is the kingdom of the Tatra Shamwa, islands in a hazy sea of cloud. Conditions are extreme at these heights, where no trees are growing, a borderland of snow and ice, where two survival specialists have thrived since the Ice Age. Other animals only arrived here later from lower-lying regions. Each one braves the mountainous world in its own way. Even in sunshine, everyone in this wilderness above the clouds lives in constant danger. Up here, everyone's a survivor. This is their story. The Carpathian Mountains stretch out across the centre of Europe. Their highest part lies between Poland and Slovakia, the Tatras, the smallest high mountain range in the world. Over 20 peaks more than 2,500 metres high cover an area of only 20 by 30 kilometres across. One of the mountains is Krivan, a national symbol of Slovakia, whose name means bent or crooked. It lies in the middle of the Tatra National Park. and is home to a crooked-horned Tatra native, the Tatra Shamwa, an animal with a special history. Shamwa are best equipped for life in the high peaks. During the last ice age, they wandered to central Europe, along with reindeer and musk oxen, when the continent was still largely frozen. When the glaciers melted, the reindeers and musk oxen disappeared with them. Only the chamois remained, since the Ice Age continued at the higher altitudes. These expert climbers sustained themselves in the coldest mountain regions of Europe, the Alps or the Carpathians. Isolated from each other, they continued to evolve. Today, the Tatra chamois forms its own subspecies. In the Tatra mountains, the chamois are the only large animals that live the whole year round above the tree line. Winter has lasted for six months up here. In late May or early June, the females withdraw to a peaceful spot where, after a six-month gestation period, they give birth to one, or less commonly two or three, kids. The offspring tag along behind their mother just hours after birth. Even in this rough terrain, a kid will be suckled for three months, during which time they stick closely to the milk source. Only when the mother is grazing do they take a rest, lying down on the slopes. There's so much to discover. On one of the last remaining snowfields, a Tatra marmot appears out of its den, another Ice Age remnant. Back then, they also lived down in the lowlands, Today, only the mountain tops can provide the cold temperatures they like. While the chamois are active the whole year round, marmots hibernate for six or seven months, living off fat reserves.
Recently awake, the first job is to cushion their dens with new grass to make them comfortable for the newly arrived offspring. What chamois and marmots have in common is their history. Both found refuge here in the Tatra Mountains after the Ice Age, like castaways on a cold island in the warm sea. After the glaciers receded, other species colonised the mountains. Animals that are not exactly perfectly suited to the giddy heights. Brown bears can climb, just not as elegantly as the chamois. Also foxes and wolves. Red deer and Eurasian lynx are faced with different challenges up here than in the low-lying areas. The mountain lakes of the Tatras also attract some unexpected visitors at 2,000 metres altitude. When the ice begins to melt, some unusual ramblers are taking a romantic stroll. Until recently, these grass frogs were comfortably buried in the ground away from the frost or hidden in earthy dens. It's surprising that they're living up this high. Their body temperatures depend on their surroundings, and it's much colder here all year round than down in the valley. The lake water is only a little above zero degrees. But the frogs get started right away with their mating ritual. After all, it's not going to get much warmer. Often, several males attach themselves to a sweetheart. All females try to lay their gelatinous mass of eggs at the lake's edge. Hundreds of frogs cluster together. It's flatter here and the temperatures are more comfortable compared to the middle of the lake. An advantage for the tadpoles. They can grow faster and leave the lake as small frogs in good time before the early winter season. Even after the last ice has melted, the temperature in the lake never climbs above four degrees. Water, either in the form of snow and ice or as a liquid, characterizes the Tatra Mountains. Rocky cliffs plummet down into the valley. And canyons jut into the stony surface. Hollows and step-like cascades provide the perfect hunting ground for the white-throated dipper. They can find plenty of insects and larvae here the whole year round. Because the streams are so steep and fast, they don't freeze easily. Over the millennia, these fast-flowing streams have fashioned nesting places for the birds into the rocks. As soon as the chicks have been served, the dipper has to head off again in search of more provisions. Wow. 
Their favorite food is caddisfly larvae. These live in tubular receptacles made by sticking sand grains together. They protect the larvae from many predators and make them heavier so that the current can't just wash them away. The whole stream is full of them. When a white-throated dipper snaps up one of the larvae, it first has to knock it out of its protective container. Sometimes they pick up other insects along the way and bring an entire beakful back to the nest. Gradually, the days get longer. The sun now sets earlier behind Krivan Mountain. Within a fortnight, all the female chamois have had their kids. Just a week after the birth, the mothers gather in kindergarten groups, looking after the offspring together. They really do help each other out. This aunt is busy suckling a whole herd, mostly the offspring of other females, while the off-duty mums get some rest. In the event of a female dying, others even adopt her offspring. The youngsters are bursting with energy from their feast. Even now, they can jump up over two meters high in the air. Footage like this is only possible when the chamois feel undisturbed. The does are highly alert when the kids are still young. They can see, smell and hear very well. But sometimes they just like to join in the fun. On the next slope, the yearlings are playing. Adolescent chamois born last summer. The ability to move quickly and securely in this terrain is a vital survival skill. The time as a young kid is the most dangerous period in the whole life of a chamois. Only half of them survive to the following year. Bears are too cumbersome to catch these swift animals. They're well aware of that and mostly just feed on grass in the summer. Lynx prepare ambushes under cover and can even take down adult chamois. They kill their victims by strangulation. This lasts for several minutes, so clinging on to a chamois around here is too dangerous for the big cat. They'd be risking a bad fall. The biggest threat to the youngsters comes from the air. Golden eagles like preying on the young chamois. These birds of prey rely on the kids for about a third of their food intake. As soon as the eagle has set off, being carried up on warm air currents to save energy the warning cries begin. A marmot has noticed the bird. The chamois does gather round the kids.
As the eagle continues to approach, they make off. The bird of prey tries to create panic among the chamois to then swoop down on a youngster, making it stumble and fall down the slope. This attack is unsuccessful, however, and the herd quickly settles down again. Summer sun warms the slopes of the Tatras, to the advantage of not only the eagles. The updrafts help to bring other species into the high mountains, those who wouldn't even manage it under their own steam. Millions of insects are thrust upwards by the wind. As small as they appear, the redistribution of this biomass has a major effect. The insects land on meadows, but also on snowfields, where they are highly visible. This water pipit simply has to pick them up, as if from a white tablecloth. Even the chamois benefit from the wind-wafted insect hordes. They're digested, then excreted, over the meadows by the pipits, fertilizing the ground with nutritious dung. The result? Grass, flowers and herbs. Such lush, juicy grass only appears up here for four months, so the chamois and marmots enjoy this warm season to the fullest. Their winter fur hangs off the chamois in clumps. Yet winter can always creep back into the mountains at any time of year. Then the snow falls, even in June. These marmots only awoke from hibernation a few days ago. And they're hungry, very hungry. After all, they've lost a third of their body weight. They need one and a half kilos of grass and herbs per day in order to build up fat reserves again for the coming winter. A few days like this don't concern them, however. Right from birth, they've been equipped for Arctic conditions. Besides, compared to the icy winter temperatures, it is now positively mild. The chamois certainly don't mind this little bit of snow either. Older animals paw patches of grass clear, while the youngsters continue to suckle with their mothers. Only if the weather was to continue like this for several weeks would things get bad for the marmots and chamois.
Further down in the valley, the streams are still flowing, but they're shallow enough for two species of fish. Brown trout like to inhabit such fast-flowing waters. To conserve energy, they use the slipstream behind roots and boulders, while European bullheads crouch on the river floor. They are poor swimmers and let the bubbling water churn over them. The streamlined trout fishtail against the current, even understanding how to exploit the water turbulence to save energy. Life in and around the mountain streams requires cunning strategies, and not only for fish. Like the alpine meadow grass, which develops bulbils instead of blossoms, from which secondary grass grows. When the bulbils get heavier, the mother stems bend downwards and actually plant the young offshoots in the ground until they've put down roots and can't be swept away by the current. With this method, the plants can prevent seeds drifting off and being washed up in unsuitable places. It's now midsummer in the Tatra Mountains, and life is good for the deer. Plenty of vegetation and comfortable temperatures, up to around 20 degrees. Although perfect for deer, this is too warm for the true high mountain animals. So even the chamois take a little drink to cool off. They graze early in the morning. Then they don't have to move around a lot during the day and can keep their body temperatures from rising much higher. Sometimes the last snow fields can provide some relief. A snowy cushion for whole body cooling. In summer, the numerous bears of the Tatra Mountains are always in the places with the freshest grass. But they also don't have any objection to a bit of cooling ice right now. And those who can't find any spots of remaining snow to offset the warm summer days can simply retreat to the shade of a cave. Down in the valley, the mountain streams have joined up at the River Bela, which is full of sandbanks. It's mostly so shallow that the water is now warmed to around 10 degrees. Besides the brown trout, graylings also live here, with their fan-like extended dorsal fins. They also like things a little warmer. Graylings can grow up to half a metre long and hunt insects and their larvae, but also small fish. Summer is also breeding season and the Bela teems with a variety of young fish. They like to gather in shallow water. It's warmer there so they can grow faster. In the deep parts, trout are also lurking. In summer, there's an abundance of life.
above as well as below the waterline. Shrimps and insect larvae attach themselves to the rocks in the current. Mayfly larvae are among the most common inhabitants of the river Bela. They feed on dead plant life and algae. They also get stuck into dead fish, however. Adult mayflies really do only live for a few hours or days, with the single goal of procreation. But the trout are skilled hunters and snatch many mayflies from the air. Grey wagtails only have to peck insects from the water surface. They're so numerous that the birds fly back to their nests with beaks brimming. Towards evening, when the caddis flies start out, the air above the river starts to get crowded. On summer nights like this, a strange event takes place. The transformation of one of the biggest water-based predatory insects. For several years, stonefly larvae, up to five centimetres long, have preyed on other insects. Now they're clambering out of the water at their final ever molting. The shell breaks open and the completed animal fights its way out, completely missing the pupal stage of many other insects. From its protective husk, a delicate aerial creature emerges, fed by fat reserves gathered while in the larvae stage. Large adult stoneflies live from four to six weeks to mate and lay eggs. The larvae husks remind one of their predatory past, clinging like brooches to the stone surface. From September onwards, the roars of the red deer ring through the smallest high mountain range in the world. The high point of their year is about to begin. While the male deer have spent the summer mostly hidden in forests, they now gather above the tree line. They need space for their rutting. They make themselves heard the whole day through. They want to attract females and frighten off competitors. In contrast to their would-be partners, the males have to make quite an effort. The hinds can have offspring every year. Males, on the other hand, only get the chance to sire children when they're in their prime, between 10 and 12 years, and in full strength. They have to prevail over the other males to conquer a herd like this. The females are not in competition with each other, however.
Younger, weaker stags only get a look in if the dominant male isn't vigilant. But this alpha animal drives this hoodlum away from his women. The young stag will have to wait for a few years before he's ready to win his own herd. He may only get the chance once in his entire life, in a single year. That's why red deer are so prepared to take big risks. Sometimes a threat is all that's needed for one to give up. But if two equally strong males meet, a fight breaks out. It boils down to the ultimate success in the life of a stag. Who gets to hand his genes down to the next generation? In contrast to the lowlands, clashes in the high mountain areas are especially dangerous. It's a very steep slope. Heavy animals like the red deer can hardly stop themselves once they start to slip down. The dominant male wins. The offspring born to the females the following year will be his. So the exhausting rutting was worth it. Even if he lost a quarter of his body weight. He also gave his all, but he wasted the chance. The fight on the edge of the abyss has cost him his life. But his death will allow others to survive. The cadaver attracts a female bear with her young. In autumn, they normally live mostly on blueberries and cranberries. This dead deer offers not only some variety, but an easy opportunity to put on some winter fat. When the cold season arrives, they'll retreat to their dens to hibernate. And so they need enough resources to get them through. Even for the bears, this is too big a feast to manage alone. Soon nothing will be left of the unlucky mountain combatant. Autumn is coming, and the grass on the slopes is turning golden, almost like the yellowish-brown summer coats of the chamois. They'll stay in the mountains in winter, just like the marmots. Now they start heading back to their dens. Each one has taken on around one and a half kilos of extra fat for the cold months. As early as October, the first snow falls, which will cover wide areas of the Tatra Mountains for half a year. The deer wander down into the valley where the snow isn't as high. So the peaks once again belong to the chamois. As soon as the frost begins, however, these mountain dwellers get down to business. 
mating season begins. This shaking is already part of the trial of strength. They plump up the manes on their backs to make themselves look bigger. This is the first round in the buck's conflict. A test with consequences. Whoever has the larger mane appears more powerful. If neither comes out clearly on top, the second round begins. A frantic chase. At speeds of up to 50 kilometers an hour. Thanks to their spreadable hooves with soles like hard rubber, the chamois are sure-footed. In order to save breath, chamois have more red blood cells than other animals, helping to absorb more oxygen. Both animals run until they're worn out. The one standing highest up at the end wins the contest. They can normally avoid the third round, which is a direct fight. Nonetheless, the winner has to stay alert. The females are only fertile for a few hours. So he constantly checks whether one of them is ready to mate. Even chamois sometimes put a foot wrong and break a leg. An easy job for a lynx. Around 15 of the rare cats live in the Tatra National Park. When they've killed some prey, they don't eat it all at once, but rather eat what they want and then store the leftovers. These are dragged into a cave, then the lynx keeps popping back to its cold store until the whole chamois has been polished off. It's a female, and she's not alone. A second lynx says hello, before being joined by two others. A whole family. It's a mother with three almost fully grown offspring. Rare footage of these shy predators in their natural habitat. One lynx after the other eats its fill inside the cave, while the others play outside. Next year, the young cats will leave their mother to head out alone in the Tatra Mountains. The ridges of Krivan Mountain are covered in snow.
down in the valley, the river Bela has still not iced over, despite the severe frost. Luckily for the white-throated dipper, they need open water to survive. But there is some ice in the river, down on the bed. Free-floating ice crystals get frozen to the ground, then start growing upwards as icebergs. An unusual phenomenon. Normally, ice freezes from top to bottom. Water is heaviest at a temperature of four degrees and sinks downwards. That's how fish and other aquatic creatures can survive in frozen lakes, only if they're deep enough. The current in the river is strong. and has many deep points like this one, offering plenty of areas for the dippers to go diving. They can hunt for caddisfly larvae the whole winter through. And even if it gets icier, this diving zone in the Tatra Mountains will remain for these rare birds. In the shadow of Krivan, the temperature sometimes sinks as low as minus 30 degrees. For many creatures, a death zone. But the chamois are tough. They search for places as sheltered from the wind as possible. Then they scrape a few blades of grass clear and simply wait for the storm to pass. They've also developed certain astonishing adaptive strategies. To save energy, they can even lower their body temperatures. As the winter wears on, the snow cover gets thicker and thicker. Old, wise females always know where there's something to eat, however. They lead, and the herd follows. The chamois are now constantly active during the day to find enough food. Taking breaks, like in summer, is not an option anymore. Often enough, this means walking through deep snow. Their thick winter coats protect them from the cold. It warms up quickly in the sun, being dark colored. The chamois stay in one place until they've eaten everything on offer, before heading off again. At the start of the year, these hikes become more and more dangerous. Now the group has to walk beneath the snow slab. The experienced doe knows the risk and hesitates. Wherever the sun shines on the snow, things can easily start to slip, and a great drama unfolds. This avalanche takes a large number of the herd with it. The chamois suffocate under a metre-thick snow load. Later on, ravens find a few remains on the surface.
a fox chases a raven away from the chamois leg. Then he suddenly disappears into the snow. With their excellent sense of smell, the foxes have tracked the dead chamois through the snow. And now these crafty tunnel diggers are not interested in sharing with anyone else. No matter what the weather, the foxes are active for days. They dig one tunnel after another, up to the dead chamois, which is lying around two metres deep in the snow. An activity which has never before been captured on film. The avalanche site is like an enormous freezer, whose contents can get the foxes through the winter. Bit by bit, they gather up the remains of the chamois to secure the best offcuts for themselves. Yet the food store lies open, and its scent attracts two wolves at night time. They make use of the fox's tunnels, extending them. This is much easier than digging for themselves or even hunting. At dawn, the wolves disappear with full stomachs. They've profited from others' misfortune, a constant narrative in the Tatra Mountains since the Ice Age. In the smallest high mountain range on Earth, the Tatra Shamwa have lived on, despite the extreme conditions, predators, freezing cold and avalanches. Poachers, however, brought them to the brink of extinction by the turn of the millennium. Since then, the chamois have increased in number again, from 200 to one and a half thousand, thanks to strict protection. The Tatra National Park is their safe haven.